Our quest continues as we dig down into the depths of real bad filmmaking. And with recent events, I feel maybe I should give the Weinstein Company a bit of a break this time. It's almost too easy a target at the moment. So instead, we've come across a film that is both super notorious and very unknown. We all know the 1939 classic The Wizard of Oz, but how well do you know its sequel? Not that one. No, not that one. I wish it was that one. No, I'm of course talking about the 2013 classic, Legends of Oz, Dorothy's Return. Created on a budget of $70 million, the concept of Legends of Oz is to be based off of the spin-off book created by the great-grandson of the original author. It was intended to be a full movie trilogy with its own TV spin-off, but obviously that didn't come to be since it ended up getting one of the worst animated movie openings of all time. It got 16% on Rotten Tomatoes and even one of its supporting actors ended up getting a Razzie Award for their work. Let's see if you can work out which one of our wonderful characters it's going to be. Let's go and dive into the wonderful world of Legends of Oz, Dorothy's Return. I spent £3.49 on this. Hey, this is quite a nice looking shot. It's colourful and vibrant. Oh. That's some PowerPoint text animation if I ever saw it. What a great opener. So the film starts out with a three minute credit sequence as the tornado swings all sorts of assets around that conveniently just sort of freeze in front of the camera, which for a start is kind of a boring static camera shot for three minutes, but also for me personally, it just kind of constantly made me think. Oh no, they got both Woodsman VAs into this? Oh god, they dragged Patrick Stewart into this? So anyway, once the actual story crops up, we meet our original trio arguing in dire times, and for some reason, the animation here just looks off. Like they don't quite fit onto the background. Is it an image or a 3D landscape here? Regardless, even as characters, don't expect much from these three. Their prior character traits have been completely reverted, because, you know, sequels and all that. But now they're just completely unrecognisable, generic fodder. Everyone's missing trait is now their character flaw. Tin Man's too emotional, Lion's too reckless, that kind of thing. Still, the three are panicking to send a message to Dorothy amidst disaster. Toto, we're home. Oh, you bloody think so, do you, Dorothy? Meanwhile in Kansas, Dorothy only gets to experience a single day. The place is wrecked, obviously, and the family seemingly have to pack up and leave because of the wreckage, especially when our first antagonist appears. Jesus Christ, have you ever heard of Whiplash? Now there's an attempt of comedy with this little lackey guy, but it's just kind of... Stupid, as is all the dialogue with this appraiser character, really. He's pushing the family to move out and condemns the house with his government power. The family then just kind of accept this and only Dorothy rebels. I guess this is supposed to be the first theme of the film to just, you know, rebel for the things you love, I guess? But as we progress further through this film, you'll find that cherry picking a theme is kind of a hard thing to do. It's all just kind of generic. Like, Dorothy next mopes to herself, and because the original was a musical, of course this film's gonna dive into songs too, starting with When the World. And like, you know, the vocals are nice, but it's just completely unmemorable, like a tick in the box. And then we see a rainbow. That's no illusion, Toto. I don't remember this in the original. Since there can't be a second tornado as a transition, we're given this new invention created by the Scarecrow apparently called the, I kid you not, Rainbow Mover. How creative of a name. And while there's a brief reunion moment with some hilarious beats. Trapped alone in a giant rainbow. It must be just horrible. Oh. It's him. He's got the Razzie Award, by the way. The connection is disrupted. Dorothy lands somewhere in Oz, and the trio are bombarded by flying monkeys, now looking like members of an outdated grunge band from the 90s. It's now we finally meet our main antagonist, the Jester. And he, uh, he kind of reminds me of somebody. Actually, a few somebodies, I think. Bomb voyage. Ah. Monsieur incroyable! 
He's alright. He's actually faintly interesting with how he was cursed to always be the fool. And his plan is to use the Wicked Witch's old broomstick to pull some strings and rule all of Oz. Somehow the magic ball at the end makes it his? I don't really know. Kinda generic villain stuff though, with a delivery that probably scarred a few kids along the way. So at this point we kinda come to the meat of the story, and while this is a feature length film, the actual plot points are awfully basic and repetitive. It's a kids movie, sure, but this film really does just nothing interesting. Dorothy wanders into one land and meets their first companion, Wiser the Owl. A bit of a counter trope already there. Their traits are their intelligence, they talk too much with an autocomplete habit, and they're too overweight to fly. Why do they band together? What's their motivation? There isn't one! Wiser here is about as one dimensional as you get, with no character motives and developments you can probably already piece together. For the rest of the film, he's mostly just in the background anyway. So where do they go? Well, they go to the candy country, where the signs all say to eat the candy thanks to Jester's magical tricks, and so they do. But the execution is just... going on. So yeah, as the two and Toto stuff themselves, there's just a weird superimposed jester overlooking them in the background. Sometimes he's a disembodied head, sometimes he's not. Sometimes his flying monkey henchmen sing backing, and then they don't. It's inconsistent, it's unexpected, and it's never really addressed again, like a lucid fever dream. Next we meet our next main character, Marshall Mallow. I actually kind of like the pun on his name. He promptly arrests all of them for eating candy and sends them to court. Yeah, isn't this the peak of child entertainment? Next thing you know, they're sentenced to death for their crimes until the court hears the name of our protagonist to be Dorothy Gale, the hero of Oz. So then they're just promptly set free. It's a bit of a roller coaster, but hey, I guess they needed some content somewhere. Also, now Marshall Mallow has joined them. At least he has some motivations being told to find their general Candy Apple. Though his response to the actual other characters are just a complete 180 to how he was previously. You know, it just nothing makes sense. Oh, speaking of roller coasters, the original trio are doing things too. Now, they're just excluded by the flying monkeys outside of their old room. So Scarecrow hatches a plan, disassembling Tin Man to make as much noise as possible, and then just running away. More monkeys swoop in with an animation which literally just looks like it was pulled out of Birdemic with how badly it's composed, and then they just abort the plan. They jump off the tower, Tin Man loses his head, luckily they make a parachute out of a banner, they recollect Tin Man's head, and then they're captured in a massive net. And after all of that nonsense, it turns out the plan all along was to just distract them all away from the tower for Dorothy's sake later. Seems a bit over the top there, don't you think, Scarecrow? Couldn't your genius brain come up with something more smooth rather than all of this? Moving back to Dorothy, we're now on our third location with a potential upcoming companion, this time in the dainty China country. What a great wall. It's made of China. What a great wall of China. Yes, we get it. Here we meet the China princess and her cliché character arc. She's vain, annoying, and uptight, and searching through a line of suitors. All of them are pretty terrible until Marshall Mallow comes forth with his bid because it's the only way to enter through the land. Why they even went to the palace at all rather than just, you know, through or around it is beyond me, but what do you know, there's apparently some real chemistry there. The princess has the same cliché development beats you can imagine, and Marshall's buy a thread arc of searching for his general is just completely wasted away here. Plus, I mean, clearly the two wouldn't work out. I mean, you know, we're all thinking it. One thing I will give credit for though with this whole sequence is the actual sound design of these China characters. I don't know what it is, but that dinky little China sound is just so satisfying to me. It's like the sound of that crystallized flooring in Super Mario 3D World. Something about it is just... Ooh. Anyway, the Jester sends an earthquake their way with no major casualties to the main characters and the princess deduces that Dorothy is the problem, luring the attack from the Jester and so banishes her away. But not before deciding to follow her herself because her country apparently needs Needs her. Uh, even though with her gone, they wouldn't need, they wouldn't have the disasters anymore. Well, whatever the justification, it's again a literal 180 degree turn in response just to keep the plot glued together. Hey, remember the original trio? 
and they haven't done much yet. And they're about to do a whole lot less as they're given to the Jester now, who promptly taunts his plans with a creepy marinette solo and a dance number over his upbringing before chucking the three on personalized traps. The Scarecrow is stuck to a wheel over a fire that burns him, the Tin Man is dunked under water to rust, and the Lion is put in a cage. One of these seems far crueler than the others, and one doesn't even seem like torture at all. Anyway you spin it, this is just poor writing and a real stretch of the imagination being asked of the audience. Turns out the cage is shrinking, but it never really goes anywhere, so... Eh? Then there's a really long montage sequence about reaching a broken bridge and building a boat out of a nearby tree. Why, Patrick Stewart, why? There's a little bit of character growth and a community growing around this montage, but then once it's built, the core crew just go off without all of these extra characters that showed up, despite establishing that they clearly needed the bridge for themselves too. It's just logically void all around. So skipping all of that, we then come to the same room as the beginning, where Dorothy sees the missing broomstick weapon and a message about the Jester before he appears in a plume of smoke and chases them out with his monkeys. I guess this is all just to establish them meeting the villain? So they flee into a cave, which the monkeys avoid because they have a convenient fear of the dark for the plot, I guess, only to be lit up by fireflies and led into the right direction. Psych! It was the Jester all along with more of his illusionary tricks. Turns out they're heading for a waterfall! Never seen that one before. Also, it begs the question, why is the Jester leaving them alone at any point? Why not just constantly barrage them with things if he could just create any disaster he wants across all of space? But forgetting logic, the group eventually fall down said waterfall, apparently never rising from the ground like falling would make you do, and then... Uh, the plot really needs to cover some bases, so... Dorothy decides to tackle the Jester alone for some illogical reason, and the others let her because... Meanwhile, the princess is broken, though clearly not dead because of what we established earlier, so Marshall Mallow mourns and puts her back together across the entire night. How does a simple, like, eight-piece puzzle seriously take so much time? Oh, and Wiser goes ahead to get help by suddenly learning how to fly. All of my years of B-movie experience should object to this, but okay. So jumping ahead, Dorothy reaches the Jester's castle, only to be confronted by puppet Glinda, probably the most scarring thing for any child to have to witness, honestly. Jester then appears, releasing the trio, who are completely knackered after being spun for hours, drowned for hours, and left alone for hours. They're out of commission, okay? We learn here that the Jester is the witch's brother, and his final attack is last minute foiled by Toto dropping a curtain onto him. Whilst the flying monkey takes the broomstick for himself to give back his own wings. It's a whole thing, don't worry. The trio wakes up, and it's a mad dash for the broomstick. Why they even were let free, I don't really know, but yeah, we'll go with it. There's a whole mini moment of convincing the flying monkey to give it away to either people, only for the scarecrow to come in with a boomerang arm swing, completely losing any of that kind of flying monkey character arc. And also, in this moment, like, the flying monkey is just teleporting everywhere between shots. Everything just kind of falls apart, and the jester ends up chasing the magic ball on the end of the broomstick, while everyone else is banding together for an all-out attack on the jester. Wiser flies in, Patrick Stewart becomes a battering ram with the others, and multiple troops are stuffed in his mouth. Just run with it, I know this is all a little bit much. The magic ball continues to roll away, but first the flying monkeys push through with their attack as the heroes use bubble gum from Candy Country to attack for some reason, even though wasn't that like a crime by death? Why are they supporting this now? Everyone gets their mini moment in this fight, and I guess this is supposed to be the pinnacle of their character developments, but there's no real arcs or callbacks, it's just character concepts being thrown in to disguise the lack of content of anyone on screen. And with the monkeys defeated, Jester finally regains his power, frothing up another tornado to follow and swallow Dorothy. In response, everyone flees and Dorothy climbs up to confront the Jester. They fight over the broomstick, which reverses all magic except the Twister, and the Jester is almost sucked in until Dorothy saves him. The others help for some reason, and the Jester pleased to have her join him in ruling Oz, only for Dorothy to destroy the ball and throw away the broomstick, only for the Jester to leap into the tornado for it anyway, and disappear off into the end of who knows wherever. And that's the end! And there's so much to unpack! Why did the tornado stop only when the Jester was in the way? Why did the magic expel when being fought over? Why did Dorothy try to save the Jester? Why did everyone go with the plan anyway? Is it part of a theme somewhere? Like, be good to everybody? Whoa! I still can't really read a theme for this whole movie. Could they really not work out how to get rid of the Jester other than this one stupid out? 
whatever the case, the day is saved. Glinda returns Dorothy back to Kansas using more rainbow magic because ruby shoes just don't work like they used to. Fun fact, those ruby shoes are copyrighted, so they make no appearance here. So Dorothy returns to Kansas, having no real grip to actually take on the other antagonist of the film, you know, remember him, but with no real lesson learned or anything of value actually going on, what does she do? She crashes onto the site to protest against the agreement blindly, assumes nobody read it, and then it just so happened to have turned out that it was all false after all. With multiple IDs, apparently this was all a scam, and none of the fully grown adults being set up to sell their homes away had any motivation to actually read into what they were getting themselves into. A true logical masterpiece all the way around. So the appraiser's arrested and his lackey runs away for a sequel that never happens, I guess, and everyone rips up their papers. So everyone is happy and they work together to rebuild their destroyed old homes. And what did we learn after all of that? Well, not a lot really. It's, it's all just kind of generic and forgettable. None of the characters have any kind of depth beyond their one-dimensional traits, there's no lesson to be learned or ideologies to adopt, and there's all sorts of holes in this movie to be picked out. And while the 1939 classic was pushing the technological boundaries of its time, giving us a world of iconic wonder, this film is pretty much the opposite in every way. It's bland, stupid, inconsistent, and pointless. Everything old is trashed away, and everything new has no substance at all. But after hearing all sorts of controversies on the production side of this movie, I think really the failure of this project is truly a blessing for all of us. A win for the industry as a whole. And hopefully stabs like this will only push creators to make some genuine quality stuff in the future. Lord knows the industry needs it, especially in child animation. But that was the story of the terrible Wizard of Oz sequel nobody asked for. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. <sighs> this is certainly different. I've been wanting to do some green screen stuff for a while, and I'm trying out a few different formulas and jokes. Do let me know what works. But if you want to edit your own clips of me in front of a green screen, do check out my Twitter, as I will be linking some raw edits there for you to put into whatever you want to. Broken glasses and all. Until I get them fixed next week. But a boom. I've... I'm getting this.